Welcome, Parks, Recreation and Community Services Commission Special Meeting, Monday, February 27th. Roll call, please. Commissioner Sasatrian? Present. Quad? Here. Michaels? Present. Wu? Present. President Kafayan? Present. The agenda for the February 27, 2017 special meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on or before Friday, February 24, 2017. Item two, upcoming council agenda items. President Kofi and members of the commission, we have a few items um, coming up on March 7th. The first item is increase our purchase order for bus, transpa bus transportation uh, four wind, with Four Winds Incorporated. Uh, we use uh, busing service for our day camp program, our one Glendale after school sports program, and for our Glendale Youth Alliance. The second item is a word of contract for Wilson Middle School Multi-Purpose Field EIR uh, consultant. And the third one would be Cerritos Elementary School Multi-Purpose Field Project request for EIR proposals. And those are going on March 7th. Any questions? Next item, please. Item three, commission staff comments. Any comments? Any candidates? Oh. Next, please. Oh, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring up our calendar of events shortly. Just a second. Okay, President Kalfai and members of the commission, we have several events and activities taking place between now and our next meeting. Uh, the first event is actually taking place on May 7th, 2017 at 8 a.m. It's the Verdugo Mountains 10K Trail Run and Hike. Uh, but we wanted to let you know that registration is now open at www.runtheverdugos.com. Uh, Teen Night Out is being offered every other Friday. Um, in March, it's going to be on the 3rd, the 17th, and the 31st at Pacific Community Center from 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. We're offering a youth employment workshop at Pacific Community Center on March 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Arbor Day will be on March 7, 2017 at the Casa Adobe de San Rafael. The deadline to submit donation forms is February 28th. That's tomorrow. Uh, we have a Riverwalk Workday at Glendale Narrows Riverwalk on March 11th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, the Spring Leisure Guide um, is, will be available online uh, as of March 13th at www.glendalca.gov forward slash parks. Uh, that same day, registration begins for Spring 2017 contract classes. We're offering a Veterans Job Fair at McCambridge Recreation Center in Burbank on March 16th from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. This is a collaborative effort between Burbank Workforce Connection, Verdugo Job Center, and the Employment Development Department. We're offering a Healthy Teens Workshop uh, featuring physical activity on March 17th at 6.30 p.m. at Pacific Community Center. Uh, also that same day, at March 17th, we have a teen art class, uh, Draw Anime, at Pacific Community Center from 7.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. We're offering Heart of Gold Wilderness Work Day at Duke Major Wilderness Park on March 18th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. An introduction to the tea ceremony at Brand Park Japanese Tea House is taking place at, on March 19th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Spring day camps will take place from March 20th through, through the 24th at Pacific Community Center and Spar Heights Community Center. And on March 25th, we have the Cesar Chavez 16th Annual Celebration at Pacific Community Center from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then we'll be back here on March 20th for another Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission meeting at 2.30 p.m. For more information, the audience can call 818-548-2000 or visit www.glendoca.gov forward slash residents forward slash calendar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next item, please. Next, we have oral communications. That's item four. Uh, discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The director may refer the matter to the proper section for investigation and report. Okay, we invite Kay Hustler, please. Good afternoon. 
afternoon, President Calfayan, members of the commission and our city staff. Uh, my name is Kay Hostetler and I live on Oak Ridge Drive. And as you know, I live next door to Palmer Park where the park is very popular unless it's a rainy wet day or maybe a very, very cold day. And last Friday night, the kids were skateboarding at 10.04 p.m. Uh, on Friday night. And I think it was like 45 degrees. So it is not unusual to step outdoors at any hour between seven in the morning and 10 p.m. at night and hear skateboarders and the, um, the uh, basketball. I didn't know a basketball could bounce so often uh, in just a short period of time. I wanted to share with you two things I found about quiet zones since um, in the past month. And one was the Crescenta Valley Weekly. And the headline was quiet zones uh, welcomed in Glendale, and it related to the uh, silent crossings and um, all the money that Glendale spent to have um, the trains not blow the whistles in the Pelanconi uh, neighborhood and over by San Fernando Road. The other one, I was at Long Beach Playhouse just recently, and I didn't know all the people would come out of play, a place like Long Beach Playhouse and talk to all their friends and have a great time, but there are two signs posted in their parking lot, quiet zone, please respect our neighbors. So I came to ask you to please continue to look for ways that we can have the park have some quiet zone at some time of day that the neighbors can count on to be able to walk on the sidewalk, walk their dogs, do their gardening and that kind of thing without um, constant noise. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, may I, are, are signs, have you considered signs like she suggests? President Coffin, members of the commission, we do have our regular uh, park signs at both entrances of uh, the park. In terms of quiet uh, zone signs, uh, we don't have any signs that say quiet zone. Uh, something we'll, to consider. I, we I can know look people into signs it. ignore signs, but you know, I, it might have an effect. We can look into it. Are the hours of the park clearly listed? Yes, hours of the park are clear on this. We have any surprises, any police uh, reports, anything uh, happening in that area? We can reach out to the police department and see if we've they've uh, request if there has been an increase in call of service. Um, as of now, everything is status quo. I believe we haven't heard. I know we had a few minor uh, injuries at the skate park, but uh, no criminal uh, or no crimes that have been committed that we know of. Okay. Actually, I want to go back to the, the quiet zone signs. Um, would you mind coming back up? Is that okay? Sure. Could you specify um, where exactly that would be posted? Yes. Long, what it would, what the, it would oh, actually, I'm not requesting the signs because I think kids would absolutely ignore them. I mean, there's no way <laughs> that they're going to pay any attention to them. I just simply wanted to bring up the fact that quiet zones are important in our neighborhood and in Glendale and in other cities too. And that other neighbors are upset about other things, not just me and the basketball court. Um, yeah, I, there's times when signs might be very valuable, but to be honest with you, and I realized that I should have said, I do not think this would be an effective measure in the park because I think it would just be something to be laughed at. Like, what are you there for? You're there to make noise and have fun and have a good time. So I, I felt that, that that was the understanding. And if there was a particular area that you thought it would be fitting, but I think overall in a park where people are supposed to be playing and exactly gathering, my problem is the constant bouncing of the basketballs when someone is there. And I found a new word recently clack. I was saying crack of the state skateboard, but when I look up the word clack, as in click and clack, clack describes it perfectly. It's like a crash against of the um, hard wheels against the sidewalk and or when maybe the kid jumps off the skateboard and the skateboard then goes into the concrete and it makes that kind of noise. I've also heard there are soft wheels for skateboards. I'm going to look into that too. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, next, Mr. Michael, please.
Good afternoon. My name is Michael Sheehan. I uh, live in Adams Hill, adjacent to Palmer Park, and uh, inconsequential to anything that I'm here for. I was about this far away from being notified about the changes that were being made at Palmer Park, and I felt kind of left out. Uh, I do know that in the city of Los Angeles, after a certain hour, you're supposed to be quiet and not bother your neighbors. So my suggestion would be you just turn off the lights where the noise is. And so, as helpful as I am. I'm going to hand you something that is, uh, so, so sorry. just pass that around. I'm, I'm here to, uh, to talk to you about the game of Petanque. The game of Petanque is a French game that is a derivative of lawn bowling and of bocce and was thought up by the French because in bocce ball you sometimes bowl like you're running up to the, to the line. And with petanque, which means to plant the feet, you have to stand inside a 50 centimeter ring to pitch the ball. And then it's pretty much like bocce. And uh, so I'm here as the uh, only member of the Glendale Petanque Society to uh, pitch to you ideas about the use of public parks for petanque. This is a picture of Palmer Park, by the way. And this area that you see right here, when Jess Duran was still at the head of Parks and Community Services, uh, and I saw all the stuff that was going on at Palmer Park, I said, you know, a, a 12 by 50 uh, square foot area of decomposed granite, granite would save a little water for the city and would be an ideal place to play this game of petanque. What else have I got? This is good old Adams Square Mini Park next to the gas station, which I've advocated for in the past. And I want to compliment you guys on fixing the roof that was evidently leaking. Uh, when I came to the Art and Culture uh, Commission meeting, I heard that the roof was leaking and that they were considering not putting art in the gas station anymore because of uh, issues with the gas station. So compliments to you on keeping the gas station fixed. But this space here, which is just about the right size for a petanque court, is now in lush growth because of the rain. But before, it was really pretty ratty. And uh, if it was taken out and uh, 10 by 40 feet of decomposed granite put in, it would be an ideal uh, place to play petanque. I think I have another view of that. Yeah, this is just looking the other way with the gas station to your left. And uh, then uh, I've been playing petanque in Claremont, which is kind of a schlep for me from Glendale to go down. But the uh, city of Claremont has embraced with both arms and a leg the uh, petanque club that is active down there that uh, is sponsored by this lovely couple that's been all over uh, Europe and all over the United States playing petanque. And they now have about 40 people who show up almost every Sunday when the weather is clement to play. And I think I have some pictures of them. Uh, this is, uh, if you don't have your glasses, this is what it looks like when you play petanque in Claremont. And uh, the, the game is so simple, but yes, so complex. And the idea is to pitch the little couchonet, which means piglet. You pitch the couchonet, which is the little jack ball out. And then the team or the individual that gets their bowls, B-O-U-L-E-S, closer to the uh, couchonet wins points. You play to 13. And the competition, when you get with people that are really good at it, is, is wonderful. And what you see is this measurement because it can be a millimeter difference between uh, one bowl and the other bowl. And, and there are discussions about it. And it's a highly social game and uh, uh, something I've enjoyed. I think I have one more picture. Uh, yeah, that's without your glasses. And this is the, uh, the, the courts are called either terrains or pistes, P-I-S-T-E-S. And, uh, and what you do is you, uh, these are very informal courts. And what I'm proposing uh, is also something informal. And the place I would pitch most for, which I didn't get around to taking a picture of, is behind the Adult Recreation Center down by Central Park, which already has some decomposed granite and some uh, barriers around the trees. But it's on a, a bit of a, a rake. 
And so I was suggesting to Jess before he uh, left his position that a little grading down at uh, uh, Central Park, down behind the Adult Recreation Center, might be a place where we could uh, invite people like the folks from Claremont to come and to play. Oh, thank you for that last one. A little green ring you see there is a 50 centimeter ring and you, you must stand inside of that. It's important to stand inside of that when you pitch the cushionet out and then when you can uh, consider to pitch your bowls. And so at this point in time, I'm the only person that's really interested in this. Uh, I did get Onig and Jess to come out and play with me behind the Adult Recreation Center. And I taught them, <laughs> I, taught, I taught them how to play and they both beat me. And so my pitch to you is that if one of these sites, most specifically the site behind the Adult Recreation Center, might be a place that a couple of hundred bucks could be spent on, it would be, for, a, for a, a, a terrain like this, it would be pretty much an ideal place to play. So that's a basic pitch. And if anybody would like to play, I'll leave my email address uh, with Iris and you're invited. Do you have any questions? You are the advocate of the game. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm really hard are you of the, hearing. Are sorry. you the advocate for the game? Uh, do you have more uh, more uh, people to play with you, or are they interested no. uh, at this time? That's why. I, that's why I drive to Claremont to play with the people that are already going. It's the second most popular game uh, next to soccer in Europe, and uh, whether or not. You know, my getting out behind the Adult Recreation Center and getting some kind of publicity and inviting people to come would boost it. I'm unsure right now, but I just found out that it was, there was an opportunity to talk to you guys, and so I thought I'd come and just let you know about it because not a lot of people in the United States know about uh, Patank. It's nice to know new games. That's nice uh, to develop uh, new games. Any questions for him? Do you have any? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Do you have any specifics as far as the size of the Patonk court compared to horseshoes or bocce ball if, we, if a terrain were to be put in, if it could be made more multipurpose? It's very casual. A formal Patonk court is about 12 feet wide by 50 feet long. But the folks from whom I learned this game up in Port Townsend, Washington, have what they call the low tide Patonk tournament. And so when the tide goes out on Puget Sound, then they go down on the beach and they play down on the beach. And so the answer to your question is that bocce, of course, would be an ideal game to play there, too. Horseshoes calls for a, a pit. And uh, having barriers or borders uh, is, is helpful. But the thing about playing up here in, in Claremont is you get to know the people in the other court when somebody throws a ball that goes the wrong way. So for me, it's a very casual thing. But if you want to see, if, you're, if this piques your interest at all, Professional patonk players in France are really serious, and you can see some just really amazing skill. I'm OK, actually. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Next, we have item 5, at A's approval of the minutes of the commission special meeting held on January 23rd, 2017. Is there any unfinished business from uh, last time, minutes? Uh, do we have a motion to approve it? I'll no. move the minutes. I'll second. I apologize. I couldn't distinguish the voices. Um, Still I grant. will move. OK. And I'm second. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Sasatrian? Yes. Fouad? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Wu? Yes. President Kalfayan? Yes. Next item. Next is six action items at A, day camp discount policy and non-resident fees. At one is a motion to approve the proposed day camp discount policy, establishing minimum eligibility criteria for applicants and residency criteria based on Glendale Unified School District boundaries. And at two is a resolution establishing non-resident fees for day camps and aquatic lessons. President Kalfaya, members of the commission, um, in December, staff brought to you a report regarding the day count discount policy and um, mentioned that staff would be looking into non-resident non fees. 
uh, Seva Garbetian is here to provide um, a detailed report on uh, the day camp discount policy as it relates to um, setting criteria, which will involve non-resident, uh, which will involve defining um, boundaries and how we would define a resident for purposes of resident, non-resident fees, and also um, who would be eligible for the discount. So. Good afternoon, President Kofayan, members of the Commission, City staff. My name is Sabah Garabedian, Senior Community Services Supervisor with the Community Services and Parks Department. So, as Teresa mentioned, uh, we came back in uh, December talking to you about the day camp discount policy and uh, requesting direction uh, with regards to residency. Uh, just a quick background, just to catch everybody up to speed. Uh, the City of Gundal has been, uh, Community Services and Parks Department has been operating day camps for the past 25 years. Uh, day camps are typically scheduled around GUSD breaks. Uh, the day camp progr uh, program provides an essential child care need for uh, parents and guardians so that they could continue working while the kids are out of, out, of, out of school. During summer break, we offer a total of seven day camps at five different locations throughout the city. During winter break and spring break, we offer two camps at two locations, Pacific Community Center and Spar Heights Communities, Community Center. These are the day camps that we offer uh, with their times, ages, uh, citywide. We also offer two specific, age-specific camps, uh, kinder camp and traveling teens camp, uh, which we only offer during the summer. Um, here's a map of where we're offering all of our day camps. Uh, again, this is pretty much citywide. And moving forward to the policy. Uh, the proposed policy will offer two discount types. Uh, the first is a full scholarship, and the second uh, type is a 10% discount. The full scholarship is a no-cost option, while the 10% discount does have a maximum fee of $150 per child per calendar year. So there are three eligibility requirements as listed in the discount policy. Uh, the first uh, being the applicant's residency, which we're going to further discuss. The second being the household, uh, the household annual income level, and the third being uh, submitting a complete application po uh, packet with the necessary backup documentation stating their income, stating uh, their residency, and so forth. Uh, as it relates to the income eligibility, CSP staff is proposing to use two of HUD standards in defining income level limits uh, for LA County as part of the income eligibility criteria. One is the extremely low income, uh, which is going to be considered applicant type A, and the next one is low income, which will be considered applicant type B. In the case of applicant type A, um, th these are applicants that are requesting a full scholarship uh, and they, their income uh, level should be extremely low income uh, with the, based on the number of persons in the family or lower. And this could be anybody applying for the scholarship uh, pending residency criteria and anything along those lines. They could apply from any source or any means. The information will be available on our website and available at our community centers. They could pick up the application packet, fill it out, submit the paperwork turn it back into Pacific Community Center. So it doesn't matter where they're coming from as long as they meet the eligibility criteria that we're stating forth in the policy. The locations where we're gonna be providing a full school, uh, scholarship uh, for camp are, are these locations, Pacific Community Center and Maple Park Community Center. There's gonna be a select number of spots available at each facility uh, to offer the 100% discount. These applicants, again, I need to emphasize that they still need to complete the forms. They still need to submit it 30 calendar days before the first day of registration. And then should they be approved, when they get notified you're approved for the full discount, on registration they have to come back and register their child, just like anybody else. The next applicant is applicant type B. Uh, those who applied for type A uh, and didn't qualify will automatically put it into type B. Those who don't qualify because of their income, le uh, uh, income level as well and wanted to apply straight for type B, um, these are the applicants. Uh, this is the income level that we're going to be following to qual uh, qualify them as applicant type B. These people, uh, these applicants will receive 10% off at any of our day camps. And basically, as long as they meet the criteria, the application requirement, anything along those lines, uh, this is the discount they'll be getting. The maximum for this type of discount per child per calendar year is going to be $150. So 
So here's the available camps uh, we're listing with a discount, with 10% off. As you can see, we've covered all of our day camps. Go back. Those incomes you showed, that was that was for the entire f family? Uh, that's, yeah, uh, household income, annual household, household income. income. Right. And then the application form will ask how many people are in your household, what's your annual household income, so. And then they need to so provide supporting documentation for each. Are we ready to move forward? Okay. Now, non-resident fees. The revenues from day camp registration fees and aquatic lesson fees will not help offset the direct ex expenses associated with running the program. Uh, will help offset, sorry, the direct exp uh, expenses associated with the program, but do not necessarily offset the full cost of each program, such as utility bills, custodial services, and ongoing building and grounds maintenance. Gundal homeowners pay property tax, which contributes to the general fund, which helps fund part of CSP's budget and helps pay for these overhead expenses, but non-residents don't. While CSP is happy to provide these programs and services to residents or of other cities and values them as customers, it is important for non-residents to help offset overhead costs associated with running these programs. Staff is proposing a $15 non-resident fee to be assessed for day camps and aquatic lessons as described on the following slides. So staff is proposing a $15 non-resident fee per week per child in the case of day camps. Here's the, break, uh, here's the breakdown of the day camps listing the fee and the proposed non-resident fee. And none of these options include extended care. So before care or after care are excluded from the non-resident fee. Before care and after care are already at $20 per option, and we're just keeping that at $20. So it's the camp fee itself. So the current camp fee as approved, and then the non-resident fee as proposed, you can see them side by side. Staff estimates to generate an additional $8,500 in revenue as a result of these non-resident fees. As it relates to aquatic, staff is pro also proposing a non-resident fee of $15 per session per participant for aquatics lessons. And the difference between camps and aquatics is aquatics might have a two-week session, which is eight classes, as opposed to camps, it's, everything's done on a weekly basis. So whether it's a session, it's an additional $15 for non-resident fees. So currently, um, staff estimates that gener uh, we will generate an additional $5,700 in the case of aquatics as a result of the non-resident fees. Currently, the aquatics budget for lessons is 35% of the summer aquatics program budget. This equates to approximately $101,500 per year. Swim lessons generate $82,000 a year with an operational deficit of $18,700. The deficit is, this, this deficit's only gonna increase as a result of the adjustment made to the lifeguard salaries uh, as, because of the minimum wage increase. So as minimum wage increase is going up, we're adjusting our guard salaries to stay ahead of the minimum wage uh, rates. Unlike day camps, however, instead of proposing to commission to increase the aquatics fees, we're confident that the non-resident fees will uh, cover the costs that are, we're gonna incur as a result of the increased staff fees. Staff verified with legal that the proposed non-resident fees would not be prohibited by law or grant funding the city may have received to construct the facilities that house the programs. We conducted a benchmark study uh, that revealed that of the 11 cities benchmarked, four of the cities offer a not resident non-resident rate. Non-resident fees range from an additional $5 per child per one week session up to $34.25 per child per one week session. Of the four cities that do offer the resident non-resident rates, there are two cities that share zip codes with a neighboring city. In situations where there is a shared zip code, these cities verify the addresses to determine if the household is a resident. Of these four cities, three respect, uh, there are three respective school district boundaries that overlap the city boundaries as well. They're, if you overlay them on top of each other, they're almost identical. Now, moving forward to residency criteria. Residency, 
The need for, uh, to clarify the residency criteria will determine the following. Residency will set the geographical limits of who will be considered for the discount policy. It will also set a determination of which customer will have to pay an additional fee as a non-resident. Based on our experience with recent summer, day, uh, summer camp registration, the department needs to alter the method in which we conduct registration, creating the opportunity for residents to receive priority registration for the day camp programs, reducing waiting times on registration day. Priority registration will be offered for the first time for day camps. Aquatics has been conducting uh, registration with priority, uh, priority given to residents for the past couple of years. And with the establishment of residency, what we're going to be considering resident or non-resident, Aquatics will have to follow suit and follow the same residency guidelines. Staff's recommendation is to use the GUSD boundaries, uh, establishing resident, non-resident criteria, inclusive of the zip codes 91201 through 91210, 91214, 91020, 91046, and 910, and a portion of 91011. So here is the city map and the G GUSD boundary map. The two options staff presented to commission back in December was whether to keep it within the Gundal city limits or to include GUSD. You can see from the map that there are three primary zip codes, 91011, 91020, and 91214, um, which have an overlap with the Glendale boundaries. Not necessarily. There's two zip codes that are directly shared with Glendale boundaries. 91011 is inclusive of the GUSD boundary but falls outside Glendale city limits all completely. So this is the same map. We just zoomed it in on uh, the area of North Glendale that's in question. And based on the summer 2016 registration for aquatics uh, there and day camps, there was 124 unique households who registered uh, children, a child or children from these three zip codes. The total number of registrations conducted for day camps and aquatics uh, from 91214, 91020, 91011, like I said, is 124. Of that 124, four were from the 91011 area. And here on the, on the screen here, you could see the first number you could see is day camps. The second number is aquatics. So 12 people uh, for, with the combined registration lived inside the city limits. If you carry it on with all those zip codes and you verify them, an additional 14 from day camps and five from aquatics live within the GUSD boundaries, but outside the city limits, okay? Same carries over for 91214. Uh, even split, 28 and 28 for day camps and aquatics, 22 and 11 for uh, inside GUSD boundaries. Um, none, none of 91011 falls uh, within the Glendale city limits, so that number would be an NA three in one when it comes to day camps and aquatics. Coming back to this slide. Um, so basically, we conducted a time and motion study to see how long it will take for staff to verify somebody's address prior to registering the person. Uh, what staff found that on average is taking us 28 seconds via the, web, uh, the website that we're using to confirm whether a person fell within or outside city limits or within GUSD boundaries. If you take that number out and multiply it by 124, that's an additional 60 minutes we're talking about in the registration time that we're adding. We want to introduce priority registration to reduce uh, the amount of time it takes for somebody to stay uh, at the community center to register that child. And we feel that by suggesting GUSD zip codes, uh, we could take that number of 124 and bring it down to four. We're talking two minutes as opposed to 60 minutes on top of that registration process. And we'll get to the registration process and the time it takes uh, shortly here. Again, we're suggesting it to reduce the number of addresses that need to be verified. We're basing this on customer feedback on registration day. Uh, customers are asking for priority registration in the case of day camps. And the other reason, the, another large reason why we're suggesting GUSD boundaries is the department's future opportunities when collaborating with Glendale Unified School District in terms of aquatics and one Glendale after school youth sports program. Uh, in the case of aquatics, if there's ever an opportunity and the ability for us to expand our aquatics program to North Glendale, Crescent Valley High School would be the primary site where the pool would be used like we have years ago. 
And in terms of one Glendale, the, the future for that program calls for an expansion to the North Glendale area where, again, Crescent Valley High School will be used, Roosevelt Middle School would be used as possible game locations and, pra uh, and uh, practice sites for each of these schools and the elementary schools in that area. So within GUSD schools and expanding program, we're talking about these areas and these schools. Now, if Crescent Valley High School would be used for aquatics, let's say, the person living across the street from Crescent Valley High School is going to pay the non-resident fee for a program that Gondal is offering across the street, while a person living three blocks away is going to pay the resident fee at a, and come in at a cheaper price. Priority registration for day camp for for day camps. Um, here you can see all of our registration locations. Uh, so we we offer day camp registration on the first day at six locations. Right now the registration for summer day camp specifically is the following. On the first Monday of May is when everybody's traditionally known as the first day of registration for summer day camps. Our community centers across the board open at 9 a.m. so we say registration begins at 9 a.m. We have people showing up at our community centers as early as 5.30 in the morning to register for camp. 5.30 in the morning to make sure that the first person in line for any reason, whether they want to get in and out as fast as possible or they want to make sure that they get whatever weeks they want for the camp that they want. So they're showing up well in advance of that registration time. Now, because we don't have priority registration for day camps, anybody's coming. It could be a resident or not. And London residents have expressed to us that, like aquatics, we should offer priority registration for residents only. Just so you guys have an idea of what we're talking about in terms of participation uh, of, for registration, North Glendale, we have 687 unique registrants from the, the zip codes matching North Glendale. South Glendale is 166 and 318 non-Glendale residents. And this is based on the proposed zip codes that we're mentioning already. So the 318 is in the 687? The 318 is not in the 687. The North three, Glendale, but the North Glendale numbers include those three zip codes that we The have. North Glendale numbers include 91214, 91020. Yeah. The 91011, however, the 91011, all of 91011, we've included in the 318. Why is South Glendale? Uh, it's three zip codes. South Glendale is considered three zip codes, 91204, 91203, 204, and 205. What is the boundary that you're using for north and south? Is it still the 134 freeway? It's still the 134 freeway. And if I could go back uh, to this map um, and just point out, there's a sliver of 91203 that's above the 134 freeway. There's a, a, a chunk of 91206 that's below the 134 freeway. But the vast majority proportionately speaking, is above. So we said 91206 above, 91203 below. So 203, 204, 205, we're considering South Glendale for the purposes of that graph. 206, 207, 202, 201, 208, 1020, 91214, and 91046, which is this small sliver here, this little pocket of Vertigo City, as North Glendale. And because of 91011 and the way this line is, um, the, this line, if you carry it over to the east of the map, let's say, goes all the way out to JPL, Altadena area. So we've said 9, 10, 11 as a majority is a non-resident in this case. So revenue source for Gondal residents. <coughs> Property taxes and utility user taxes are the two taxes paid by Glendale residents that come to the city uh, as revenue. Homeowners pay 1% in property taxes, of which 13.5% comes to the city of Glendale from homeowners. Property taxes are the largest revenue source, approximately 27% for the city's general fund. Residents also pay UUT, 7% electric, 7% water, 7% gas, and 6.5% in tele, uh, telecommunications, 6.5% in video, uh, which also comes to the city as revenue. 
Another revenue source for the city is sales tax, which is not specific to Glendale residents, as all shoppers in Glendale pay the tax regardless of their residence. Staff was able to confirm that residents who live in the Los Angeles County unincorporated area do not pay any taxes through the property tax bill to the city of Glendale. A portion of their annual property tax goes to GUSD and to Glendale Community College, but not to the city of Glendale direct. On November 9, 2016, voters approved the parks funding measure A, which means all homeowners will be paying a parcel tax of one and a half cents per square foot on developed property beginning in January of 2018. The county will be distributing a portion of the funds collected directly to cities using a formula calculated based on population. The general fund helps fund maintenance and operation of CSP facilities, which translates into overhead costs for programming. Staff estimates that start, uh, with the starting deficit imp, uh, for impacted camps of 44,000 and an additional revenue of 36,500 as a result of increasing the fees back in October and, an, and another $8,500 in non-resident fees should the proposed discount policy be implemented and commission set the resident non-resident criteria as proposed, the estimated operational deficit range will be anywhere from negative 28,500 to negative 45,500 then this range is as a result of the full 100% discount uh, scholarships that we're offering. So we have a minimum maximum range. So, so the net loss is a bit more? The, the net loss will be slightly larger, yes. If you look at the maximum, yes. Now, we're also taking into consideration, we saw 318 non-residents register uh, from uh, you know wherever, and we're not taking all 318 that number and multiplying it by 15 and coming up with a number. We're actually bringing that percentage down to slightly less than half because we're also assuming by introducing priority registration for residents, there's gonna be less opportunity for a non-resident to be able to register as well. So we're taking that con into consideration as well. How are you, um, how are you calculating the 45,500? How many 100% um, scholarships are you including in that number? Um, uh, right now, this number is based on 10 100% scholarships. It's the minimum, like half day morning, which is, might be the cheapest 100% scholarship you could give out, or full day inclusive of before and after care. So. That brings me to the end. Just to summarize, the proposed discount policy has the best interest of the target population in mind where extremely low-income families will receive a full scholarship while low-income families will receive 10% off. Given the department's limited resources in terms of staffing and budget, considering the sections and department's goals and overall mission, staff is proposing to use GUSD boundaries as per the zip codes listed in the policy. Staff would like to establish non-resident fees for day camps and aquatics lessons to help reduce the operating deficit for each program. Finally, staff's proposal, uh, proposal also includes defining residency criteria to set the guidelines for priority registration, non-resident fees, and day camp discount policy eligibility. Good job. Uh, just a quick clarification. Your staff is suggesting we use the school boundaries. Right. So if you're in if you're in the school but outside of the Glendale, you, you would still be considered a resident for purposes of this. Yes. Okay. Yes. Any questions? <clears throat> the hundred and fifty dollar maximum mm -hmm. is that something that we approved um, during previous meetings? Because I don't recall that, or is that something that the staff has suggested? Well, and I wasn't clear. Is the hundred and fifty maximum discount or maximum, maximum per year? Per year. Per year. Of a discount. Discount. So right. a person, a family can't get more than 150 per dollars. child. Per, per child. child can't get more. So than a family could get a 300, 450 discount. It's okay. per child, no more than 150. So and it's it's not something that it was recently introduced. It was there in December as well, um, when we proposed and came to your commission for feedback. Okay. Well, offhand, it seems like it'd be pretty hard to reach that number because you're only talking about 15, 10 dollars here and there, here and there. So. Yeah. To get 150, you'd have to really yeah. take all the all the weeks. Take all the discounts and be active the entire summer. It's it's basically somebody who's going to be active the entire year. Uh, that 150 is kind of basically where we're capping it off. Um, but I mean, depending on what you register for, if somebody's registering for an $85 camp, times four weeks, 850 bucks, 10 percent off, we're talking 85 dollars. So it's it's hard to get up there, but it's possible. 
And what's the, um, explain how people get priority in the non residents because you get 9 a.m. instead of May 1st. That's for residents, it's going to be residents only now? So right now it's 9 a.m. on the first Monday of May. What we want to do is we kind of want to change that up. We're trying to look at the aquatics model and probably bring it in on a Saturday. It'll help with people who have to take time off work and find childcare. Um, maybe we do it at 10 a.m. or whatever the time may be. We just know that whatever time we spent, people are going to come and wait in line. So the later we push it in the day, the better it is because they're not going to be camping out overnight. Uh, but this, one of the models is either doing it later in the day Monday or doing it on a Saturday to accommodate and just have it for Gundla residents only. If that happens, then they would have to prove, uh, prove they're a resident of Gundla by bringing their utility bill or whatever the, the policy states would be necessary for you know, verifying that they're a, a Glendale resident. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get it. What's the, what's, what's the non-resident? Do they, do they register later? Or they they register later, right. The first day will be exclusive for residents. Okay. It'll be a set window of time as opposed to a 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. like in the case of Pacific on the first day. So it'll be, for example, a 9 a.m. to noon. Anybody in line at noon will be able to register. Anybody trying to get into line after that, or I'm sorry, priority registration is not closed. Please come back on Monday, if you visit us online, register online, whatever the case may be. Now you mentioned online just then. Can people mm -hmm. register online? They can register online, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow the online accessibility to be available when everybody could register. Priority registration you have to do in person. Because right now the reservation system that we use, our registration system, um, we're not 100% solid that it will be able to identify somebody as resident, non-resident per zip code. And in the case of 9, 10, 11, we want to make sure that if somebody's living outside the district boundaries, pays the non-resident rate. We're talking about four people at the end of the day, how much possibly you know, is it going to impact? But we want to make sure that the online system and resident, non-resident match up. We've never used a, that feature in our program before. Any other questions? Um, I have a quick question. So if a resident wants to take advantage of the priority registration, um, they have to come in person to apply to register. Um, and then you're going to be doing the verification of, of residency that morning? Yeah. And if it's, if it's as simple as bringing in the piece of paper, then, I mean, we see the zip codes, we're good to go. Can we consider maybe doing like a pre-screening where if they are going to be coming and they're a resident and they're coming for the priority registration, mm -hmm. like they submit the paperwork and we kind of pre-screen them so when they come, they've already gone through that process so they've already cleared it so we maybe have like a checklist, oh, Mr. So-and-so has already been pre-screened, they've been determined that they qualify as a resident, thus they can uh, come to the priority registration so it won't take additional time that morning with additional staff time and then the people coming to register uh, and having that additional however many minutes it may be, but maybe something that we could just kind of do prior to that. Well, President Confine and Commissioner Wu, um, if, if the commission decides to approve as proposed GUSD boundaries, then anybody living in 91214 or 91020, they're already going to be considered a resident, which would make them eligible to come. So a 9, 10, 11 person, absolutely we can make that available to them and say, this is my address, I've been a returning customer, like in the case that we have for four. We could go back and say, okay, based on the zip codes, actually we've already done the work to come up with the numbers, you, you're good to go, you could come on registration there. And, and what happens if somebody comes and they're incomplete, they don't have something? Um, Do they lose a priority? They just have to bring it back when they can. They, they just bring it back and we're, we're accommodating in that way. I mean. Somebody forgets, they rushed out of the house, they didn't want to miss the date. Their parents, most of us are parents, we get it. I mean, it's going to happen. It's not often that we get that. No more questions? I have comments, but no questions. Okay. I think uh, you've done a very extensive uh, research and good job. Thank you. and. Uh, if we have a motion to approve the increase. I have comments and suggestions for changes. Okay. That's okay. Um, initially, when the fee increases were brought to this commission, um, prior to voting on it, and which actually began this discussion of discount policies, I personally stated that I didn't want any low-income families to be impacted by the fee increases. 
and we made the motion back then uh, according to those comments. Um, I know that we've, we're now implementing a discount policy, but I still see some day camps that are uh, not giving that opportunity to the low-income families, so I do have an issue with that. Um, in regards to the GUSD versus the City of Glendale boundaries, um, I believe that residents that pay into the general fund should be the ones that are considered residents when it comes to policies. Um, I don't think uh, spending 60 minutes identifying those is, is, is a bad thing. Um, and I know the staff made comments about collaboration with GUSD. I think we can visit that issue um, when the time comes and if there is an opportunity to collaborate with the school district as well as Crescenta Valley High School uh, for their aquatics. But you are either a resident of the city or you're not. So if, if, you, if you're paying into the general fund somehow, then you should be getting the, the discount policy. If you're not, then you're not. Um, I, and I don't like differentiating between the two. Um, you have an idea how many people would are in GUSD but outside the city? How many people participated last year? I would have to go back and pull up the exact number. Maybe I have it available. I think you had it in the right, slide. I, I think I did. It's 124, right? It's, well, it's 124 addresses that we needed to verify. <clears throat> so inside city limits, we're looking at 30 uh, for, let's say day camps alone, 36 people fell in, in inside city limits. And at that point, uh, 36, 39 people fall outside of the city limits, but within GUSD boundaries um, in the case of day camps. 32 in the case of aquatics fall within the city limits and 16 fall outside city limits within GUSD boundaries. I'm not taking into account 9, 10, 11 at this point because 9, 10, 11 and Glendale city limits don't share that zip code. 9, 10, 11 is unique to locking out at Flint Ridge. The only part of 9, 10, 11 that's shared is with Glendale Unified School District. So to include 9, 10, 11 in that count is not correct. And what was your rationale for including anybody in GUSD? Um, anybody in GUSD, the rationale was the collaboration. The rationale was that's 124 addresses that we needed to verify at time of registration. Yes, we could possibly do it ahead of time. That wasn't an option at the time when we were thinking of, but that's 124 people we would need to verify, and if 124 of those people came to priority registration, 56 people are going to be told, no, I can't register you, you fall outside the city limits. That's 56 people now. Staff would have to explain as to why they're not available to register where they have in the past. That's 56 people times the number of minutes. Oh, because currently anybody in GSC is a, has no, a resident, there, non resident There is no not resident, non-resident fee or a priority registration for camp. So it's been anybody could come in on the first day of registration, pay the same amount and walk away. So that that the confrontation that's going to create at six of the locations where we have registration, for example, that's what we were trying to avoid. We were saying, well, let's address four addresses, let's verify four addresses as opposed to the 120 addresses. And this is based on summer 2016 numbers. And these numbers will always be fluid because you never know who's going to come back the following year or be a new customer. That's the re rationale why. So your reason for including GUSD uh, was to avoid confrontations at registration? One of the reasons was because we're trying to speed up the process of the registration day. Our complaints are it's taking too long to register. Priority registration will help with that registration process, but to turn around and bring in a verification, address verification on priority registration day would have basically counteracted the priority registration. Now what we're saying is the time in motion study took 28 seconds to verify each address. It takes me 28 seconds before you, you and I could even talk about which camp you want to register for, for me to say, okay, where do you live? Let me verify whether you're a resident or not on registration day to say, yes, I could go ahead with your registration. If you're not a resident, now I have to tell you, unfortunately, sir, madam, whatever, whoever the person is, you're not a Gundal resident per our policy, therefore I can't register you on registration day and have to explain to them. If you are a a resident, then that registration process could take anywhere from 8 to 20 minutes per person that you're registering because of the way our camps work, because of the number of options we work. It's custom tailored to the, to the customer, so we're but trying again, to reduce. I'm not hearing why the rationale for including GUSC. 
Um, it, what you're describing happens regardless of whether they're in or out, right? Mm, no, it doesn't right if, now. We accept it. Do you understand? Do you understand? If sure. I may add, um, President Kalfayan, um, Commissioner Fouad, I think the three reasons that we had um, identified for uh, going with GUSD boundaries versus Gondol boundaries was staff resources, the, the amount of time that it would take or add to registrations, and then um, also collaboration with GUSD. So those were the three different reasons. So the first one being that limited staff resources being that we didn't have the funding to be able to increase the number of staff that would be required to um, keep the registration times as is because verifying addresses would of course increase the period of time like um, Sevok had identified so to avoid increasing wait time for registrations so that was the second reason and then the fact that if we were to um, expand our programs into North Glendale then there would be the um, example of the resident living across the street from CV who would attend the uh, aquatics program but have to pay non-resident fees. For Those were the three reasons. But again, we're here for direction from the commission and whatever commission's direction is staff was willing to do. But those were the three reasons we identified in recommending GUSD versus Gondel boundaries. One thing we also discussed in December was the, the day camps, they are tied to the GUSD calendar. Yes. So the times that the day camps are running are set by the GUSD calendar anytime there are three days out of school. The day camp is scheduled, is that correct? That is correct. correct. Three days or more. The staff brought the fee increases because we, we needed to generate uh, additional revenue, correct? 156 uh, <laughs> non-resident fees just going with the numbers that you're providing. The non-resident fee increase um, or the difference between resident and non-resident are actually uh, much higher than the discount that's being offered for the within the discount policy. Um, I don't know, and I, if you can please explain what the GUSD calendar has to do with whether you are a resident or not. That would, sure. I think that would be my first question. President Kaufman and Commissioner Osatarian, if I may, um, the 156 number, what is that reference to so that I could? You said there, there are about 156 individuals that fall within those three zip codes, right? Uh, sorry, I might have misspoken, 124. 124, okay. So 124 residents fall within those zip codes. Of those 124 residents, these residents, based on summer 2016 numbers, fall within the city of Glendo limits. These residents do not. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, that was 56 people that did not fall within the city of Glendale uh, limits. 56 people times $15 non-resident fee is basically the difference. The, this is the discussion. And staff, um, I mean. Just to clarify also, um, there are more non-residents. So those are just the ones that borderline Glendale um, GUSD boundaries are non. So there are. 318 non-residents as of 2016 registration. So, so we were just identifying the difference between how many addresses we would staff would have to verify if we went with one boundary versus the other, but there's still an additional 194 other um, participants that would pay, pay the non-resident fees. Just to clarify, so the 124 is just the number of participants that we were, or addresses that we were looking at that were, um, crossing borders between GUSD boundaries and Glendale boundaries. So, let me see if I can find a better slide for you. So maybe this will break it down better. 9, 10, 20, 9, 1, 2, 1, 4. Should be the same numbers. It's like 27 plus uh, 18, That's, is that the number then? Or total, well, you have the total. I have the total. So the it's 70. City limits is, yeah. Yeah. Are we accepting the I would, I would like to <coughs> recommend that we stick with the city of Glendale boundaries and not go with GUSD um, when it comes to the resident and non resident. Um, and I'm I know it goes against um, our initial meeting about the the fees, but I, th I think it makes it difficult to 
to make sure that all of the day camps are not affected by it. So I'm okay with some of the day camps having a bit of an increase. But I don't think that we should be following GUSD laws. So you're either giving into this fund or you're not. Does anybody who, in GUSD, not in the city, do they, any of the taxes they pay, does it go to the city, to this program? The answer would be no, right? No. Mm -hmm. You have to be the city to pay, like your earlier chart, uh, utilities tax and property tax, you have to be in the city. So the people in GUSD aren't paying any more than somebody from, from Mars. Or the, um, President Coffey and members of the commission, uh, these programs are enterprise programs, so they're not tax funded programs, they're not general funded programs. So basically, we're supposed to break even at the end of the year, which we don't. Um, other programs, other enterprise programs that we um, show a profit will pay for our day camp program, the loss in our day camp program. So with that being said, the increase in fees will uh, reduce our deficit, but it won't close our deficit. <clears throat> but in terms of taxes, um, it's an enterprise program. So you're so. saying technically, you, you mentioned the two tax sources, but technically they're irrelevant because it's an enterprise thing. Yes. It's supposed to be self-sufficient. I yes. guess the fund makes up a deficit. But the, yes, the fund makes up the deficit, but it's an enterprise program. General fund is not, uh, there are no general funds that are uh, uh, deposited into the enterprise account. The general fund offsets the overhead, so um, like utilities and the facilities that uh, the programs are run out of are funded through the general fund, but the program itself, the cost of the program is not funded through the general fund. And then just to provide some clarification on the fees, uh, on the taxes paid, the um, La Crescenta Unincorporated, so the, the individuals, homeowners outside of uh, the city boundaries, the property taxes they pay, will a portion will go to GUSD, um, but it just doesn't come to the city and to the general fund. So they do pay taxes into GUSD, it just doesn't directly come to the, um, to the city's general fund. That was part of the report that he provided breaking down. Correct. Right. It's but when he said GUSD taxpayers, it's just that there's... Right, it, it goes right. to the GUSD funds, mm -hmm. but not to the city of Guantanamo. Correct. Hills. And that is exactly what I'm proposing that we do. Which, which camps we don't have a discount on? We're offering a discount, uh, President Kaufman, we're offering a discount at all of our camps. Um, and let me list them. It's a matter of the increase. So when you're increasing and then um, offering the discount policy, some of them... Um, are offsetting the other, but... Um, but we're reaching everyone, right? We're not uh, discriminating any. We have discount for everyone, every program. Correct. Right. The 10% discount is available for all the camps that are being offered. It's just because of the price. Uh, we're basing it based on the increase, because back in, I believe it was November when the fees were increased, um, the difference in the increase and the discount that they're offering, I think, is what Commissioner Asatrian is referring to. In some instances, you'll notice that the increase um, is less than the discount we're offering. In other instances, the increase is more than the discount that's being offered. It just depends on the cost of the um, camp. A perfect example of that is a spectacular camp. So, for example, if you look, we've increased it by $15 but the discount that's being offered is $6.50. So it's an increase too. Right. So regardless of the discount policy, the low income is still impacted by that. The extremely low income would still qualify for a full scholarship, which would be free to any of the camps that they choose to go to. So the extremely low income, because there were two um, income limits, so the extremely low income still have the opportunity for a full scholarship to any of the camps, which would be zero dollars paid out of pocket. I, actually, that brings me, I, I had written down here and I never asked, um, what's the limit that you want to set on the um, full scholarships? We, we were, uh, President Kaufman, members of the commission, we were, uh, recommending a hundred and fifty dollar per child per year limit on the, um, sorry, the ten percent, and then for the full scholarships, we were recommending a five um, person full scholarship limit at Maple, and five at the the camps offered at Pacific. So sorry, what was what was the, just the five per? What was that? It's five f full scholarship spaces will be made available at Maple Park, 
So even if it were a very low-income person might otherwise qualify, if they're not among the five, they don't get the scholarship? Uh, to start with, that's, that was our recommendation, um, and we need to see what the demand is going to be for full scholarships. I mean, uh, we have to play it by ear as well. It's the first year we're offering a full scholarship, so we can't say we're going to open up 50 spots and not have the demand. <coughs> or, or well, well, why do you have to have slots? But you just if people qualify, they get it. If they don't, they don't. Um, the way that they camp numbers work for registration is if a person is going to be eligible for that full scholarship, we want to make that space available to them, assuming they come on registration day. So if, let's say, Maple Park Community Center could, for example, I'm just throwing numbers, they're not actual numbers, Maple Park Community Center uh, could accommodate 75 people in their full day program, we're going to register for 70 people for that full day program with five people coming in as the scholarship to get us to that 75 number, the capacity based on staff and the building and et cetera. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Conversely, in the term in Pacific Community Center, if that magic number for Pacific per week is 100, we're going to register at 95 and come up to 100 in terms of participants uh, we via that difference from the scholarship. That's what we're doing. So we want to make sure that space is available for the scholarship. So if we increase that number, we're going to take away from somebody who is actually going to pay whether they apply for the discount or not. Well, do people who get the scholarship, are they, are they, is it first come, first serve like the regular? Non they are first come, first serve, just like the regular public on if we set a priority registration day on priority registration day. But we want to make sure that we don't oversell and push them out. For example, if we did registration on Saturday, and the, the mom, single mom, needs to go to work Saturday morning, wherever she needs to go to work. She doesn't have, she doesn't have the ability to take off work and take the hit of not working her part-time job, for example, to come to uh, the location to register. We would want to make sure that that mom who's eligible for the full scholarship gets their child in. So we won't register ahead of time so that we're consistent in making sure that nobody registered before registration day, but we'll make that one space available for that mother, assuming we know we've had this conversation and dialogue prior hand. So that's why we, we want to make those uh, modif uh, adjustments so that we could accommodate for these people. And I think uh, in my conversations with staff prior to uh, this coming um, to the commission, um, my understanding has been that the staff has been extremely accommodating um, to find scholarships for, um, for, for youth and families that really can't afford it, um, even before we've even talked about this policy. So I hope we can continue in that spirit, um, regardless of the spots, if there are other sponsors that can come through. Okay, it's very difficult to satisfy everyone. Uh, they done their job, they uh, done their research, and they trying to satisfy from extreme low income to minimum, uh, wherever is the scale. So if there is more recommendation, we have to adjust. Otherwise, we have to move Well, on. I'd like to make a motion to change the boundaries, if that's up for the what discussion. Do, what are we going to gain about, uh, from that? You're, you're going to get uh, 56 uh, non-residents, right? Uh, based on if it's and summer 2016 numbers, 56 non-resident in terms of fees. Correct. Are we going to be able to fill up those uh, uh, the spots? Uh, Does demand always exceed supply in, in your? Uh, President Kaufman, members of the commission, with demand in terms of Pacific Community Center and just recently Maple Park Community Center will exceed. Uh, the supply we have sold out at both camps. Spar Heights Community Center sells out each week, but they do a weekly registration, so the demand on the first day to register for all nine weeks isn't there, as opposed to camps at Verdugo Park and uh, Griffith Manor Park, where people have the luxury of registering on a weekly basis, knowing that they don't, that it's not going to get filled up, and they don't have to pay the full registration up, mile, up front. So. So. We Pres. Oh. With the 56 from those three zip codes, it would be the, the Spartacular camp that would likely be the closest camp there. The concern I have is if we set that with a non-resident fee, we're going to have those, those registrants that would normally go to Spar the Spar Heights camp go somewhere else or that Spar Heights camp may not hit capacity. So going with the GUSD boundaries, it's the first step of implementing the non-resident fee. And I agree with staff of setting it to the GUSD boundaries as being a first step. 
since we don't know how many will or won't, the 91011 zip code has about four registrants. So it's, it's a small boundary to adjust and we can get information of what the registration actually will be this year with the non-resident fee and be able to adjust next year should we need to. But I just see it being more appropriate based on how the, the camps are scheduled, where they're marketed to, being the school calendar when GUSD students are out of school, Spar Heights Camp is an option. Well, in terms of adjustments, I think it's very hard to allow somebody cheap thing this year, next year, oh, by the way, you're no longer eligible for it. I think that's harder than never having it included them. How, how strongly does staff feel about this? Is this a big component of your thing, or is this just fielder's choice? President Coffey and members of the commission, um, staff strongly feels that we should um, use the GUSD boundaries. Um, as Mr. Garbedian mentioned, um, it will take a I think a little bit more than 29, 30 seconds to check an address. Um, I've been at Pacific Community Center during registration, 5 a.m. in the morning till you know 5 p.m. at night, you know dealing with all the parents that want to sign their children up for camp. So our recommendation is um, keeping it within GUSD boundaries, plus the collaboration that we have with Glendale Unified. We do have a very good relationship with Glendale Unified with our One Glendale program, and hopefully once when the economy gets better, we can expand our aquatics program once again to uh, CV High, uh, Crescent Valley High. And uh, we have um, we have received a few requests from, you know, GUSD boundary parents that don't live in the city of Glendale to look at continuing to use the GUSD boundaries and not making it open to city of Glendale residents only. So that's where staff stands um, for the report. Well, I think personally, I'm, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but if, it's a, if you think it's a big deal, I'm willing to go with your recommendation and just do a GUSD boundary. So I don't know how the other members feel. Looks like uh, Mr. Michaels uh, feels like it. I think I've made my point. <laughs> President Kalfai and members of the commission, there, there is a motion on the table. Um, we would either need a second or if um, Commissioner Sachin is willing to retract her motion, but we do need to address the motion that was made. Okay. How does that work? Well, well, well I we mean, could if, ask for a if, second. If, if everybody else is, fails, does, do the rest of the commissioners feel like they want to go with the GUSD boundaries? That's what the, it's on the table. No, because I, I made a motion to change it to City of Glendale. I, I think the answer is yes. So do I need to retract it or? You could either retract it or if there's no second, it'll, it'll just uh, die. It'll, Let it it'll die. fail. All right. I'm not retracting it. Is there a second? Okay. Seeing there's no second, motion fails. Okay. I need a motion now to approve. I, I move we approve it as outlined in the staff report, the program. I'll second. Okay, I'll take roll call. Commissioner Sasatrian? Yes. Fwad? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Wu? Yes. President Kalfayan? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Garavet. I'm sorry, President Kalfayan, members of the commission. Um, we also have a resolution um, that has been proposed. Is there a motion and a second for that? Or were you moving every, or was the motion for everything? But the the um, Commissioner Michaels, were you moving both the motion and the resolution, so approving the day camp uh, discount policy and the non-resident fees together? Uh, it was Fawad who made the motion. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Fawad. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for the clarification. And I will second vote. Okay. okay. Next item on. Thank you. Uh, the next item is 6B, Shoal Canyon Ballfields Concession Building Project. At one is a motion to review and provide feedback regarding the Shoal Canyon Ballfields Concession Building Project Concept Plan. Okay, um, President Kalfi and members of the commission, um, 
staff is requesting a motion to review and provide feedback regarding the Shoal Canyon ball fields concession. Um, Shoal Canyon was, ball fields was built in 1974. It's a nine-acre site. We have three ball fields there. They're actual baseball and softball fields. But we also use those fields, the out, um, outfields for soccer and football. And the last improvements that were made were in 2008. We uh, including grading, irrigation, relamping of the lights, electrical fencing, and sod replacement. Um, the new project that we're um, uh, that we will like to uh, complete is to build a new concrete building, um, which will include men's and women's restroom, two ADA uh, family restrooms, a small storage facility for janitorial supplies, and a concession stand for our youth groups to use during night and weekend operating hours. Also an oversized roof overhang, which will uh, be built to be used as a canopy for some, for some shade, ADA walking path, and also some uh, parking improvements, uh, repaving of uh, uh, part of the parking lot. Um, here's a aerial concept plan. We'll have the uh, building in between uh, baseball field uh, number one and two, and we'll have a new accessible walk path that will go towards the third field, which is on the top of uh, the uh, picture, the slide, and a walking path that will go towards the parking lot. Um, the 3D perspective of the facility would be a 900 square foot building like I mentioned before, we'll have restrooms, ADA accessible restrooms, concession stand, janitorial supply room, and also a overhanging roof, which will provide some shade for uh, the players. And here's a, another floor plan of the facility. And we're basically, after the meeting today, we'll go to council to approve the concept, uh, request to uh, our AC6 architect to draw um, the construction documents and bid and award the project and construct, construct the project in the hopes of having the project completed October of 2018. If there's any questions, we'll be more, I'll be more than happy to answer. Where are the funds coming from? Uh, the funds will be alloc are allocated through the enterprise account. We have around 600,000, actually 592,000. Uh, budgeted for the first phase of the project. The second phase will be to uh, demolish the existing restrooms that we have on site, um, demolish it and basically plant sod and have some additional open space in that area. So we're not getting, uh, we're not taking away any green space. So the more green space we have, that's where our AYSO and our soccer groups will use uh, for soccer practice. On, with the existing service building, there is a driveway to access that. How would service vehicles get to the new restrooms and concessions? Uh, they will go around it, uh, around um, through the parking lot um, into that area. So yes. they would go, yes. would there be additional paving here? No, the same paving. Okay. Plus, the, we're going to be having meals or smaller carts, like go-karts. So. Uh, we won't have track, truck access. It'll be the go karts that'll. Uh, My concern is just to make sure it didn't go across the fields. Or oh no, we won't. We won't be going over. No, we won't be driving on the fields. I, I just have a comment. It's not really that relevant. That, that building looked pretty stark. It's, it's literally concrete blocks with no, nothing to jazz it up a little. I guess that's. I mean, it's cheaper obviously that way. But that's the cheapest way possible. Uh, we got a quote for 1.2. We're trying to keep it below budget. Uh, for all the improvements in that park. Uh, we have talked to AYSO and Foothill Little League. They're excited of the new location and for them getting a new concession stand. Um, they haven't been using their concession stand for about five years now. Um, so they're very excited uh, with this project. Okay. No more questions? With the uh, proposed improvements, do we also see a, a spike in our uh, projection of revenue as well? 
Actually, the ball fields, the show ball fields, are used by our youth groups, and our youth groups do not pay um, rental permit. We do have um, high schools that use the facility. Um, private high schools use for baseball practice during the day and some weekends, uh, but the revenue would be the same. Uh, we would have an increase in concession. Our concession permit is $100 a month, so we'll have probably about $1,200 a year increase in revenue for the use of the concession building. And there's no landscaping, no trees, it's just no shade, it's just going to be that with the, that extended yes. canopy. Yeah. The fields are always uh, used, right? The soccer field and the baseball. Seven days a week. So let's have a motion to approve. Well, I move to approve the project as presented by staff. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. <clears throat> Commissioner Sasatrian? Yes. Quad? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Wu? Yes. President Kalfayan? Yes. Item 7 reports information only at A's Glendale Sports Complex Annual Report. President Kalfayan, uh, members of the Commission, um, I would like to uh, you know, let you know that the report is in your packets, but uh, due to time, I would like to move forward with uh, the section activity reports. Uh, for park services. Uh, so Mr. Panosian can highlight uh, some things that his section has done in the past few months uh, regarding park maintenance. So we're moving to the next item. Park services. Thank you. So that's Good item, I'm sorry, just to read it into the record, it's item 7C2, park services. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, President Kalfaya, members of commission. Um, the past couple of months, I have not been here to show you the beautiful work that we do out in the field. So the recap of the pictures will be from the months of December and partially November, December, some January. Uh, we do, we have been submitting the written report. You've had it for the past two months. And for the uh, month of January, we completed 199 work orders, a uh, total of 677 labor hours, 166 by groundskeepers, 16 by pest applicator, and 17 by irrigation repair. We have been blessed with plenty of rain this year, which uh, affects some of the work we're able to do as it relates to projects and shifting some personnel to filling gaps in other areas. And the projects to highlight, we had uh, in the month of November, December, we started working on two additional fields, Montrose Ball Field and Pacific. For Montrose Ball Field, every year we renovate the Little League Field. There are portions of the sod that we have to remove because of the wear and tear that it uh, experiences. And this is a portion of the outfield at Montrose Small, which is the Little League Field, that we had to excavate the, uh, the existing turf. As we normally would do, we have it prepared and ready for laying sod. We also change what we call the key. This is the, the pitching mound and the area right in front of the pitching mound that actually gets a lot of play and uh, exercise as well. And after we seed, we top dress, we allow the infield and the outfield to, uh, uh, to grow, the seeds to grow. And after we do the prep field around the perimeter, we uh, make sure irrigation is working and functioning properly. And this is the, uh, the picture of the infield before we turned it over to our uh, Little Leagues. And moving over to Pacific Edison, uh, as you can see from the aerial, this gets a lot of soccer play as well. So soccer does impact the turf quite more extensively than regular baseball play would. And we don't have pictures of during, but after the work was done, it was seeded twice because the first time the rains washed our seed away. And the second time we see it, we're able to keep it in place and give a much better quality field to our, uh, to our Little League using the Pacific ball field. And at Brand, we had done some uh, dead trees. There were several dead trees that we had to address. This is one by the, uh, the trails uh, near the Green Cross and a uh, dead tree that was taken down by our staff and removed. Uh, we also did some uh, reflushing of the la landscape in the parking lot as bare areas make themselves presentable and available for planting, we add some more landscaping to it to uh, make sure it eventually f flows and, and covers the entire area. What we wanted to highlight also was some of the work we had done at Palmer Park. I know this is post-fact of the opening of the facility. Uh, there are some pictures of the completed project before we open. This is the, uh, the pool area. Uh, this is a shot of the picnic areas from the south the turf area along with the shade canopies of the playground. 
And this turf area, the reason why we're showing it is our staff worked in conjunction with the contractor in getting uh, some of these areas done, specifically the turf area, as well as some of the landscaping. These are the basketball courts from the south end of the uh, skate park. The shade structure over our play area, more landscaping at the perimeter. What, uh, another shot of the turf here. What our staff also did, as you recall, is the uh, community garden. We'll show you pictures of the improvements we made at the community garden. After we were done getting the garden prepped, we felt that a, uh, the color it had on the walls, you could see the old uh, tannish, brownish tone, didn't match quite the facility, so we figured an ideal color would be is whatever we painted the rest of the park. So we had staff paint the entire area, the walls, the perimeter, four walls, three and a half walls. And then at the end, we have the community garden from the, the far end, the, the west eastern end, including the little structure that you see in the middle where we keep the supplies. This is what it used to look like before, if you remember, and here's what it looks like now. And as of beginning of February, we've started assigning the plots back to the original owners. And if you go now, you'll start seeing some of the vegetation growing already in our community garden plots. We also did some landscaping around the perimeter of the park. Uh, as you can see, some of the shrubs planted, they are in their very young stages. As the shrubs grow, the idea is to have it grow the same size as the remaining of the shrubs, cover up some of the gaps we had in the perimeter fence, and also raise these up a little bit to help with some of the noise and some of the uh, use of the park to prevent it from impacting our neighbors. Another shot of the park from far off. And then City Hall. You might have noticed this is Christmas time. Uh, some of this work was done between uh, the Thanksgiving weekend and the 1st of December. You might have noticed some of the decorations around uh, City Hall. This is all done by our staff. And one unique individual has a vision of every year improving on what he's done in the past, Mr. Chris Peplow. This is the plaza walking in, just adding a little color. And then as you start coming into the plaza, you would notice the uh, little gingerbread dudes, I used to call them, the gingerbread people, I should say, all around campus, and each one with its unique design. These were all handmade by staff with their vision, and uh, a lot of times Mr. Peplo worked on weekends and nights to get these things done, so kudos to him. And uh, we did but use... They're, a but they're not edible. They are not edible. I, I would, yes, I would definitely avoid eating them as they're made of foam with, with uh, some, some wood in the middle to hold them in place. And this is walking you through the, uh, the, the plaza. Of course, uh, this is the first individual that will say hi to you as you walk into the plaza. And Jinji, uh, as he named it, would be the first as you walk into City Hall. And, of course, we have a maintenance guy washing the uh, windows in the back. Kind of hard to see. Um, and as you walk in, the decorations... Um, you have them being the soldiers, nutcracker soldiers, guarding the, uh, the elevator to get up to second floor to the chambers here. So you are in good hands during the months of December. And then, of course, the Christmas tree and more of our friends sitting in the uh, plaza. Kids loved it. Uh, I brought my kids, and they loved taking pictures. Everybody was amazed by the gingerbread people uh, this holiday season. And there were a couple actually hanging from uh, right outside of the hallway here. Of course, the snowmen, they were building a snowman, and they were actually uh, throwing snow at each other and playing snowball fights. It was unique, and, and Mr. Peplo says I'm one of the kids that he likes to please the most. And we're looking forward to next year's, um, next year's project. He's already started working on it. We're not allowed to see it until the end, so look forward to it. This next couple of months, we'll be doing a lot of projects. We start working in Brant, the northern area, past the library, to start refurbishing it, doing the irrigation, and uh, planting some seed and sod, bring that place back so we can open up for picnicking. Uh, we've done the uh, Cerritos playground surfacing for safety. We're looking at the Glorieta Park, fencing in the outfield ball field fence, as well as fencing around Verdugo. So we have a lot of projects upcoming, and uh, we'll be happy to show them to you in the coming months. I can pass along the residents of Northwest are very happy with the new lights at Brand. That's they, they great, great to hear. Nice. That is great. That has been a good improvement for safety, mm -hmm. and aesthetically, it actually makes the park lit and... Uh, highlights all the beauty of the park. So, good to hear. Thank you. Did the rain uh, uh, cause any floods, any uh, problems with us? We did not ma experience major floods because we were prepped in most cases of the areas that needed to be addressed. For example, the, uh, the drains that needed to be unclogged, they were unclogged beforehand. There is a little bit of runoff that we experience all the time, especially in the hills. For example, at Duke Majin, the DG pathway that it is at a very a steep uh, 
from the, the hillsides. It's very steep, and water does flow down. We do get a little ruts in the, um, the trails at Duke Majan Park, so those are in schedule. If they haven't already been repaired, they've already been patched. We did have some slides over at the sports complex trail, and that is something we've cleared for, in most cases, what we can. We have a contract uh, contract are ready to go as soon as the rain subside by sometime later this month, in March, I should say. In March, towards the end of March, we're going to be looking at um, putting some retaining walls to fix and repair the slides over at the uh, sports complex trails. So there was some uh, trail maintenance that was necessary. We lost a few trees as uh, towards the end of the past couple of storms that we had. But overall, things held up quite well, and uh, that was for staff's credit to having things prepped, not to have a lot of flooding in the parks. And of course, sprinklers are such that they don't go on. We have turned off the sprinklers since beginning of December, and I'm proud and pleased to say they'll stay off for hopefully another month, and we can uh, conserve our water this year. Any questions for Mr. Panosian? Thank you. Any more? Next item. Um, Commissioner, I'm sorry, President Kalfine, members of the Commission, just to clarify and for the record, item 7A, 7B, 7C1, have been sub the reports have been submitted and filed, and Commission has no questions, correct? Okay. In that case, then next is adjournment. Okay. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>